the blonde with the red glasses. That's how you may know our next guest. Those trademark glasses say a lot about Sally Jesse Raphael. She didn't mean to make a fashion statement with them. She simply needed them in order to read the television prompter. She's practical and no nonsense. That's 48-year-old Raphael, whose name includes her own, Sally, her father's, Jesse, and her mother's maiden name, Raphael. She calls herself an every woman with universal problems and appeal. But few women have seen the trouble she's seen and lived to talk about them. Liza Minnelli just dropped by Sally's New York West 57th Street studio to chat. So did Shelley Winters. Weekday mornings and twice on Tuesdays, Sally has visitors drop in to tape her coffee clatch of the airwaves. Surrounded by these rosy walls, Sally's audiences hear truths much stranger than fiction. The mayor, who is a sex addict, black women with blonde hair, newlywed murderers, all have sat in these hot seats. Often the titles are more titillating than the guest. The day we visited, the subject is more sedate. Miracle makeovers for cancer patients. This is, this is my hair, so I wouldn't forget the color. Oh, half of my guests today say they are insanely jealous of their thin sisters. Nine years ago, post Phil, but pre-Oprah, she joined the lineup of the talk show Cavalcade and has since won high ratings into Emmy Awards. The show has provided a comfortable lifestyle for her and her second husband, Carl Soderlin, and their brood of eight. You heard me right, eight kids, ranging in age now from 16 to 30. Some hers, some his, some taken in. Carl and Sally split their time between their upstate New York home, crammed with collectibles from their world travels, and a Manhattan apartment. They also own and run a bed and breakfast inn in Pennsylvania. But don't let the glamour of the TV job and the multiple homes fool you. Anytime I'm in a laundromat or a supermarket doing what anybody else does, people come up and they go, you, here! Like, okay, like, why? Well, uh, well, I had to wash this laundry. Then you feel in that you must tell them why you're in the laundromat, the machine broke, or you got a big rug to wash, or why you're in the supermarket. Most people can't realize that you can get out of the little box. So yes, the little thing in the box walks around. <laughs> you know, I think probably Madonna has eventually got to go shopping, doesn't she? Doesn't she go to the drugstore and try on a new mascara, doesn't she? Sally was raised a pampered daughter of a successful broker in Puerto Rico. Her strong mother encouraged her outgoing daughter's interest in theater, dance, and music. At 18, she married her first husband and had two girls and moved back to Puerto Rico. There, she talked her way on to talk radio and met Carl, first her boss at the radio station, now her husband of 27 years, manager and chief cheerleader. How did you decide your career, the two of you as a couple, decide your career would take precedence? Carl put it first, and he made that decision. You can't make that decision for a man. And he made that decision with a great deal in the face of a great deal of adversity. Go back 26 years and find a man who says, oh, I'll tell you what, my wife will have the big career. I think maybe the world is catching up to Carl after 20 years. Together, Carl and Sally set out on a checkered journey that would make a good talk show title itself. I was fired 18 times, Sally's episode would read. Her ever flexible family would hit the road in search of another broadcasting job for her, sometimes sleeping in their car and eating ketchup on crackers to survive. I, I hope I no never money. forget any of that, Monica, but I'd, I'd like to not do it again, if that's all right with you. But why did you keep at it? My father made me promise that I wouldn't learn sh typing or shorthand. I virtually did not know how to do anything else. We had kids that needed to eat, and uh, my husband is plum stubborn. He is the most cussedly stubborn Scandinavian on the face of the earth. Um, and he would not let up. Would I have let up? Yeah, probably. I probably would have packed it in a long time ago. There was a funny story in the book about how a horse race yeah. led to the demise of your first marriage? End of the first marriage. There was the straw that broke the camel's back, and the straw was that we went to the races, and he didn't know it, but I had been supporting us partly by <clears throat> at the races. And it was a fairly good handicapper. And I told him to bet on a horse three days before Christmas called Santa Jesse. 
The race started and Santa Jesse, which was a 100 to one shot, came in faster than you've ever seen any horse go anywhere. My husband did not place my bet. I had given him the money and he said, I saved you all this money. That 100 to one shot is never going to win. And then the race went and I turned to him and I said, I have a feeling it's over, babe. <laughs> <laughs> Sally's own experience with love and losing it helped her host her ABC radio network talk show. For 10 years on the popular national radio show, she talked to listeners about finding love. Then she wrote about it in her first book. Some of Sally's love instructions. You went so far as to detail the dressing for a sexual conquest. In other words, a woman was not supposed to wear tight jeans because men have a hard time. They couldn't get them off. off. No man can get off a pair of women's jeans. There is a reason why women wore what we wore for generations. It had to be easy to get off. And you also said men should not wear too long boxer shorts and be sure to take off your socks before you're walking around. Yes. Why? Are you married? Yes. Have you ever seen your husband in with his socks on, oh, yes. without the rest of his clothes on. <laughs> there is nothing worse than the way a man looks wearing any kind of shorts, no, his bare chest, and his socks. If he's going to undress for sex, undress, get those socks off first, guys. You said don't limit yourself to the idea of one love for one life. Plan to have at least four important loves in your life. It is statistically correct Monica, that the average American has what they, in their own words, call four major loves in their life. The reason I wrote that was at the time that you're in love with somebody, you believe there can never ever be anyone else. That's what's damaging. When you lose love, you can, if you, if you can get through the mourning period, you will go on to love again. What is it that has made your relationship the two of you, Carl and you, be so long-lasting and still it's obvious from the way you talk about him just as fanciful and fun and caring as it was from the beginning. Him, not me. Um, I'm not so sure I'd want to be married to me. In fact, I think I wouldn't want to be married to me. Why yeah. wouldn't you want to be married to you? Um, I probably am too caught up and too busy to be an awful lot of fun. It's like a workaholic. Workaholics are the happiest people on the face of the earth. People married to them are not thrilled. But um, I could be much more fun and was when I was broken out of work. This workaholic gave up one of her jobs, her radio show, this past May, after 10 exhausting years of working two full-time jobs and 18-hour days. Uh, my husband was very insistent for a year before I gave it up that I do it. I refused. I, I cried and, and screamed, and in the end, he won. Uh, and the idea was that we were to have more fun, more quality in life, and that I was to be around a little bit more. So, did you get more time? No! <laughs> but I've done some things I've never done before. Like what? I've been going to restaurants like a grown-up. Now, here's the problem. The money I lost by giving up the radio, I'm now spending twice as much as that by going out to the places where I could afford to go to if I worked on the radio. Now that I don't have the income for the radio, I have the outgo at the restaurants and the movie theaters. So will you tell me why life is very confusing? And that's true. I was sitting the other night, I looked at, we took four people to dinner. It was one of these bills that you look at and you go, no, no, this is the national debt. Let me have the bill. And they go, no, no, this is the bill. And I go to my husband who wanted me to give it up. I said, you know, honey, in three hours I could have earned. And, I, and instead of earning it, we spent it. Now, how do you feel? Oh, I rubbed it in. Oh, I'm so mean. Oh, I love that. Now, you had two children. Carl had two children. You all adopted a child, and you've got three foster children. Yeah, that's too many. The more you have, the more chance that something will go wrong, and it does. I thought the other day about Joan Rivers. She has one daughter. So she's going to get one, at the most, one phone call just before she goes on the air. Mother, I don't have any money, or can I borrow your dress, or whatever. I am going to get eight. And I want to hear from them. I love them. I worry about them. So as much as you grouse, it's not real. Yeah, 
it's real. <laughs> of course it's real. It's darn real. It doesn't mean I don't love them. It means I'm exasperated and life would be much more efficient if nobody came to call and uh, you, I didn't ever have to go home. Haven't you ever seriously thought about moving and not telling them where you were going to be? I seriously, you know, I speak Spanish. I could speak Portuguese real quick. I could go to Brazil. I think seriously, every time there's a turnoff, airport, this way, I think seriously about how wonderful it would be just to go right like that and come back years later when they've all lived without me. Of her eight children, Sally has just one left at home, the 16-year-old. But none of the children is married. She complains in her own humorous way that the problem is none of them has read her book, Finding Love. 